Would you take your Bible, open to the Gospel of Mark chapter 10. The Gospel of Mark chapter 10. We're going to be looking at verses 46 down to verse 52 today from Mark chapter 10. And I'm going to ask you if you will stand for the reading of God's Word, stand in honor of the Word of God this morning as I read this passage to you this morning. Mark chapter 10, verse 46. And they came to Jericho as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people. Blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by uh, the highway side begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. But he cried the more a great deal, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. And he, and he casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith has made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. This is God's word to us today. Thank you. You may be seated. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, thank you for this beautiful story. Help me, Lord, your servant, to make it clear. May we see Christ high and lifted up. And may you teach us, Lord, to exercise faith as we see here in this story. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, sometimes God will use the most simple and unlikely of people to teach us lessons about how to exercise faith. And I think these are lessons that we need to learn today. And in our passage today, what we see is a blind beggar who's going to teach us about faith. Now, Mark tells us his name, Bartimaeus, and that's unusual because let me tell you that of all the people that received a healing from Jesus in the Gospels, This is the only person that we know of by name. This is the only name of a person that we get of someone that Jesus healed. And I think that's significant. I think that Bartimaeus is being emphasized here uh, uh, for several reasons. But one of them, I think, is because of the way he exercised faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this incident takes place while Jesus is going out of Jericho. We saw this in verse 46. And they came to Jericho... And as he went out of Jericho with his disciples. Now remember that Jesus is making his final journey to Jerusalem. In just a few days, he's going to die for the sin of mankind. Now he journeyed down from Galilee in the north, down to Perea. And now from Perea, he's making his way along the east side of the Jordan. And as he crosses the Jordan River, the first city that he's going to come to is the city of Jericho. Now let me just remind you that in the Bible, there are two Jerichos. And we can confuse these sometimes when we're reading Scripture. There is the Old Testament Jericho that we read of in the book of Joshua that is now, you can go to the land of of Israel, you can still see the ruins of the Old Testament Jericho. It's still there. And then two miles south of that, there is the New Testament Jericho. And this is the Jericho where we're going to see this miracle take place. So Jesus would cross over the Jordan. He would go to past the Old Testament Jericho, on his way to the New Testament Jericho, and there is where he met up with blind Bartimaeus. Let me tell you something about this New Testament Jericho. This was a beautiful spot. It is literally an oasis in the middle of a desert. This is a place where Herod the Great, who was a great builder, you might remember if you read the New Testament, Herod the Great built the temple. It's called the Temple of Herod. Uh, He built a a Herodium, which is a a place where he stayed, a beautiful palace on top of a huge mound. We could also say mountain. He also built a fortress on top of Masada that you can still go and see there today. He was a builder. And he built a winter palace in this beautiful spot of the New Testament Jericho. It was filled with palm trees, this spot. It was filled with fruit trees. It was filled with uh, rose plants and almond trees that were there. He built palaces there. He built a theater there. He built a chariot race course there. All kind of things. This is a beautiful place. Jesus would spend two days here just before he makes his final pilgrimage into Jerusalem. While he was there, uh, Jesus uh, meets up with Zacchaeus, the tax collector. 
And Zacchaeus puts his faith in Christ. And now he's on his way to Jerusalem. The Bible says in verse 46, there was a crowd of people that were following Jesus. These were the pilgrim worshipers because remember, it was the feast of Passover. And they were on their way up to Jerusalem. All these worshipers, Jesus was kind of leading a parade of people as he's going up into Jerusalem. And as they pass by this certain location, there's blind Bartimaeus we see in verse number 46. And he sat, the Bible says, by the highway side begging. Now, again, he, Mark mentions his name. And notice he also says he's the son of Timaeus, which is really kind of redundant because the word bar, Timaeus, means son of Timaeus. But Mark makes sure to emphasize this. For example, we say you know, in the Bible we see uh, Peter was, the, was bar Jonah, the son of Jonah, and anyone who goes through a bar mitzvah is the son of the covenant. The word bar means son. But Mark is emphasizing this because, remember, he's writing not to Jewish people. He's writing to Gentiles who were not aware of the Hebrew ancestry or custom of names. And so Mark is clear to point him out, and, and it says that he sat by the highway. He was begging for his living. I have been to Israel several times. Whenever I go over there, I go to the Mount of Olives, and I take a certain path down into the city of Jerusalem and go into a certain gate. And I've been there three times, and each time I like to walk this path and try to imagine what it was like when Jesus walked from the Mount of Olives into Jerusalem. And the first time I took this path, there was a certain cross-section where there was a beggar, a blind beggar that was there, and he had a cup, and he was asking for money, and I gave him some shekels. I went back the next year, and guess what? He was there again at that same spot. Went back the third time, and guess what? He was still there at that same spot, same person. And so I come to realize that he was a kind of a regular fixture there. And I think this is the same with Bartimaeus. I think that he was situated there at Jericho because this was a place that was one of the major thoroughfares of that day. There was a steady traffic of people that would pass through that city, and they would have to pass by where Bartimaeus was begging for alms. So he was a permanent fixture there. In fact, the very reason that I think Mark names him is because he was well-known, perhaps, in that area as blind Bartimaeus. And he was there year after year after year. And on this certain day, however, something different took place because notice verse 47, when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. When Bartimaeus heard that Jesus was passing by, he kind of raised a commotion. And he cried out, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, what I want us to see here in this story are lessons of faith that we can learn from Bartimaeus and apply to today. The first lesson is this, faith seizes God-given opportunities. That's what we see here. When Bartimaeus heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he cries out. Can you imagine his life every day the same, living in a world of darkness? He would grope around for a crust of bread, take his staff and tap his way from where he lived, perhaps a shack to this normal spot. And every day he would cry out, like most blind, poor beggars of that day would cry out, alms for the blind. And through that, he kind of eked out a way to survive. But this day would be different because Jesus was passing by. Bartimaeus heard with his ears a large crowd that was coming by. He asked someone near, what's going on? And someone told him this was Jesus of Nazareth. And immediately Bartimaeus saw his window of opportunity and he took full advantage of it. He began to shout at the top of his lungs, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Uh, he took full advantage. He saw his opportunity. You know, I think that people today uh, are more blind than Bartimaeus because they don't really see the opportunity that they have today for salvation. Do you understand that today in this age of grace, this is a day of opportunity for you to have salvation? To have God work mightily in your heart? There's going to come a day when that day is over. Right now, Jesus offers himself to all as Savior. But that won't be always. One day, Jesus will be the judge, and the day of salvation will be over. And so Bartimaeus sees his opportunity. He reaches out. He cries out. 
And by the way, Bartimaeus really is a picture of you and me. He was blind physically, but you know that all people are born blind spiritually? The Bible tells us this. Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the blindness of their heart. You know what salvation is? Salvation is God taking us out of darkness and into light. Like the, we sang the song a moment ago where John Newton wrote in Amazing Grace, I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see, friend, that's salvation. So faith sees as God given opportunities, but also notice faith persistently cries out to God. We see again in verse 47 where when he began, or excuse me, when he heard that it was Jesus, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. In verse 48, and many charged him that he should hold his peace, but he cried out the more a great deal. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. When he starts crying out, you can just hear the people around them. Would you be quiet, old man? Stop yelling in my ear. And you know what? That didn't deter this man one bit. He knew the business of begging. He was not shy. He cried out all the more. He was persistently crying out. I think the kind of faith that God honors is persistent faith. Remember what Jesus taught? Ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. The verbs there are all present tense. Keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. And in fact, there's kind of a gradual intensity in those verbs there. Spurgeon wrote this, faith asks Hope seeks and love knocks. Let your prayer be adapted to the case. Let it increase in intensity. That's what we see here with Bartimaeus. Uh, he doesn't stop crying out. In fact, he just increases in intensity. He cried out all the more. With all his heart, he cried out. He was persistent in the way he approached Jesus with his voice. I, when I read of great Christians in the past... I read of Christians who were persistent in their prayers. They didn't just pray and give up. They continued to pray. I may be speaking to some people here today. You've been praying about something, and it hasn't happened yet, and you're tempted to give up. Friend, don't give up. Let Bartimaeus encourage you. Use more intensity. Just keep on asking. Keep on seeking. But here's another thing about faith. Faith is rooted in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, notice that when Bartimaeus asked, the multitude said, this is Jesus of Nazareth. But when he cried out to Jesus, he didn't cry out Jesus of Nazareth. What did he say? We saw it two times, once in verse 47, once in verse 48, where he said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, this beggar was blind, but he saw what some people were unable to see. He saw that Jesus was the Messiah. He uses the messianic title of Jesus. Now, let me tell you something. In all the gospel of Mark, this is the only time that someone calls Jesus son of David. The only time. Not even the disciples use this title about Jesus, but this was the messianic title. And you remember that back in this time, there was a fierce debate about who Jesus was. You remember when Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? And they said, well, some say that you are Elijah. Some say you're Jeremiah. Some say you're John the Baptist. Why? Because there was a fierce debate about Jesus, who he was. And there were even the scribes and the Pharisees who were trying to, uh, to dis discredit Jesus. And they made all these accusations. They said, you heard this saying in John, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? This guy's from Nazareth. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? How can he be the Messiah from Nazareth? Evidently, they didn't know that he was born in Bethlehem. But he grew up in Nazareth. And then some of them even made a blasphemous accusation. And in John 8, verse 41, some of the Pharisees said, we're not born of fornication. And the implication is, you're born of fornication. You, you're the, you're, you're the, the product of an immoral relationship that Mary had. What a blasphemous thing to say about Christ. Now think about it. Here were these scribes and Pharisees. They followed Jesus everywhere he went. They saw his miracles. They saw him healing people. They heard what he taught, and yet they would not receive who he was. They were more blind than Bartimaeus. 
Someone once bluntly asked, blind in death, Helen Keller, isn't it terrible to be blind? To which she responded, it's better to be blind and see with your heart than to have two good eyes and see nothing. Bartimaeus may have been blind with his eyes, but he could see with his heart, while others could not see. He saw that Jesus was the Messiah, and so he cried out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And by the way, he may have known the Old Testament passage where the Messiah, when he come, what would he do? Among other things, according to Isaiah 35, 5, he would be able to open blind eyes and cause people to see. And Jesus, by doing this, proved that he was the Messiah. But the point is, it's important that our faith rest in the Jesus that is revealed in Scripture, not a Jesus that is made up by the world, a Jesus that is fancied in someone's mind, but rather a Jesus that is revealed in the Scripture. That's the one that you must put your faith in. Now, here's the fourth lesson. Faith appeals to God on the basis of mercy, not merit, on the basis of mercy. Notice where he says, have mercy on me, several times. Now, Bartimaeus didn't stand before Jesus, straighten up his appearance and say, you know, I've lived a pretty good life. I've been faithful to the synagogue. I've never hurt anyone. I've tried to do the best that I can. And based on all of that, Jesus, would you open my eyes? No, that's not how he came. He knew that he was a blind beggar. He knew that God owed him nothing. He had nothing with which to commend himself. He came purely based on mercy. That was it. Now, I think here in Mark chapter 10, the way this is organized, it's, it's very purposeful. Because what you see here in this chapter are different conversations that Jesus had with people. And what we see here is a purposeful contrast. You remember the rich young ruler? We saw that story a few weeks ago. Remember the rich young ruler came to Jesus, and what did he want? He wanted to know about eternal life. He wanted to have eternal life. But when he came to Jesus, he came with all this religious pride. He came to Jesus with a sense of entitlement. And Jesus could see this. He could see his heart. And Jesus said, you have to obey all the, all the commandments. If you're going to go that route of being religious, then you have to obey all the commandments. You remember what his response was? I've obeyed all these from my youth. You talk about blindness. That's a different kind of blindness altogether. Here's a man that thought that he obeyed all the commandments from his youth. And that was an answer that was full of darkness, full of self-ignorance. And Jesus said, well, then there's only one thing left for you to do. Sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and follow me. Now, again, Jesus wasn't laying down a universal principle of how you follow Christ, but Jesus was addressing this man's heart. He knew that this man's God was money, that money was his idol, that this man didn't see how sinful he really was. And when Jesus gave him that proposal, you remember that the Bible says he went away sad, and the word is actually appalled. He was appalled at the thought of selling all that he had to follow Christ. And what Jesus was trying to do was to show him his own self-blindness, the fact that he would come to Jesus with a sense of entitlement, as if you owe me this. And then you have right after that, what other narrative do we have? We have James and John coming to Jesus, and they asked Jesus for something. What did they ask Jesus for? Lord, that... We might be one on the right hand and one on the left in your kingdom. They also came with a sense of entitlement. After all, Lord, we've left all. We did what the rich young ruler wouldn't do. He wouldn't leave his business. He wouldn't sell his things. But we've done that. So therefore, would you please make it so that I'm on the right hand, the other on the left? Another sense of entitlement. Again, more blindness because they didn't really understand what they were asking, and Jesus pointed that out to them. And I don't think it's an accident that after those two narratives, what do we have here? We have the narrative of blind Bartimaeus, and he's got something that he wants to ask Jesus, but he's not coming with a sense of entitlement. He's not coming with religious pride. He's not coming with a you owe me type attitude to Jesus. He doesn't come based on merit at all. When he comes to Jesus, he comes completely broken. He comes to Jesus based on mercy. He comes with nothing in his hands. He comes poor in spirit. 
He comes with that childlike faith that Jesus had spoken about here in chapter 10 when he said, except you become like a little child, a dependent little child. And here, blind Bartimaeus is an example of that, that childlike faith where he comes based on nothing but mercy. I want to tell you something. If you want God to hear your prayers, don't go into the throne room with a sense of entitlement as if to say, God, you owe me these things. God doesn't respond to that, but I'll tell you one thing he will respond to, someone who's broken and humble, someone who will go to God based on the mercy of God. God, will you have mercy? Faith appeals to God on the basis of mercy, not merit. But here's a fifth lesson. Faith is personal, not general. Notice where he said, have mercy on me. That's personal. He didn't say have mercy on us. He wasn't speaking for all the other blind men that were there. We know according to Matthew's gospel, there was at least one other blind man that was there. It might have been polite for him to ask for both. Or he could have tried to get the blessing on the group plan because he was a Jew, a son of Abraham. Lord, bless all of us. He didn't do that. Generic faith won't do. The only way anyone can come to Christ is to cry out and say, Lord, have mercy on me. It's me. I'm the one that's in need. I'm the one that's a sinner. I'm the one that's blind. Be gracious to me. You know, the prayer that I pray more than any other prayer, the prayer that I pray is that my children and my grandchildren will know Jesus as their Savior. That's the thing that I pray more than anything else. And I pray daily, Lord, please, move mightily in the hearts of my children, my grandchildren. So they would know the Lord. I love the prayer of Catherine Booth. You know what she prayed? Lord, I will not stand before thee without my children. I will not stand before thee without my children. I can pray for my children, but I can't have faith for them. They have to come to Jesus on their own. And you may be here today, and you may be the child of a godly parent or grandparent. You might have a godly heritage or a legacy, but I want to tell you something, friend. You don't get into the kingdom of God on the group plan. You have to have your own faith. You have to see yourself as you are. You have to come to Jesus on your own and say, God, be merciful to me, to me. But then there's another thing about this faith. This faith is specific in its focus. Notice what happens. I love this. Look at verse 49. And Jesus stood still. Now, I love this. Here's Jesus, and he's on his way to Jerusalem. He's got a crowd, and he hears this cry, Son of David, have mercy on me, and Jesus stopped dead in his tracks. What's amazing to me about this is that last week we just saw where when Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, the disciples were following him. They were amazed, and they were also afraid. Why were they amazed? Because Jesus had set his face like a flint to go to Jerusalem. He was determined to go there. He was on his way there. And the disciples were amazed by that because he had just told them, when I go to Jerusalem, I'm going to die. And I told you, if I knew that me going somewhere, I was going to die at that place, I wouldn't be in a hurry to get there. But Jesus was determined to go there. He knew what he had to do. But here in this case, he's on his way to Jerusalem. He hears this cry, and he stops dead in his tracks. It's almost like he was saying, I'm not taking another step until we find out who this is. In verse 49, he commanded him to be called. In other words, find this man. Who is saying this? And they called the blind man, saying unto him, be of good comfort, arise, he calleth thee. And I love verse 50. And he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. I love that Mark focuses on that little detail. He threw away his garment. Why does he mention that little detail of throwing aside his garment? It also kind of shows a purposeful determination on Bartimaeus' part. You know, if you're blind and you have a garment, it'd be very easy to trip over it. But he casts it aside, and that is precisely what you should do when Jesus calls out to you. Cast aside whatever is hindering you and go to Christ go to him. And look at verse 51. And Jesus answered and said unto him, what wilt thou that I should do unto thee? Now, does that question sound familiar? 
Again, this is the same question we've heard several times. We hear it with James and John. They asked, or actually, uh, James and John came to Jesus and said, Lord, give us what we ask. And Jesus said, what do you want that I give to you? And here it's the same exact question. By the way, the rich young ruler didn't get what he asked. And James and John didn't get what they asked. But here's Jesus, and he asked this question. And again, I think this is a purposeful contrast here in these narratives placed side by side because Bartimaeus is not asking for status. He's not asking for greatness for himself. He doesn't come with a sense of entitlement based on his own merits. He wasn't seeking glory. He wasn't seeking exaltation. He wasn't even really being asked to be delivered from his poverty. It was a very simple, specific request. And what was it? Lord, that I might receive my sight. When he uses the word Lord, it's Rabboni in the Greek. My Lord, that's very intimate. And really, it's a confession of faith. His faith is right there. My Lord, my Master, that I might receive my sight. I love that he was very specific. Let me ask you something, friend. Do you have a need? Go to Jesus. Be very specific about what you want. Go to him and ask him. Tell him humbly. And here's the next thing. Faith is bold in its request. Think about, think about that request. Think about what he's asking for here. Lord, that I might have my sight. He's asking for a miracle. I, like, I think that God likes it when we ask for things bold and big. What did he say? Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things. Psalm 81, 10, where it says, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Open thy mouth wide, and I will fill it. This was certainly a big request. Lord, I want to be able to see. Now think about this. Of all the members of the human body that are finely tuned, there is none more so than the eyes. In fact, when Charles Darwin was making up his blasphemous idea about evolution, trying to explain how it all happened, he admitted that when he got to the eye, that was the greatest challenge to his theory. How could he explain the eye, the human eye, with respect to evolution? And he wrote this, to suppose, he admitted, that the eye with all of its inimitable contrivances could have been formed by natural selection seems, I confess, absurd in the highest degree. Well, you're right, Mr. Darwin, it is absurd to think that the eye is a result of evolution. The human eye itself should convince everyone that there is a God. How intricate it is. How incredible it is. Man has not yet been able to make a camera lens anywhere close to the human eye. The human eye possesses 130 million light-sensitive rods and cones that convert light into chemical impulses. These signals travel at a rate of a billion per second to the brain. In the retina, there are 120 million rods for dim, for night, for peripheral vision, and about 7 million cones for color and detail. Now, I'm not sure exactly what I read, but it sounds pretty incredible. The eye can distinguish millions of shades of color. Small wonder that it troubled Darwin. He said, to this day, the eye makes me shudder. It should make you shudder. Even today in medicine, with all the medical breakthroughs, with all the technology that we have, there's no cure for blindness. And here is this man all the way back in that day, coming to Jesus and saying, Lord, I want my sight. I want to be able to see. He was asking for a miracle. Let me ask you a question. What miracle do you need God to do for you? Because from a human perspective, there was no way that this could happen. What he was asking for was incredible. It was impossible from a human level. And you might be here today and you might be facing an impossible situation where there's no human way of, of, of making it happen. Let me tell you something, friend. God still does miracles. He will still hear prayers of his people. 
Thou art coming to a king, large petitions with thee bring. His grace and power are such that none could ever ask too much. So he comes with this bold request. Faith is bold in its request. But here's the last lesson I want you to see. Faith results in the mercy of God on our behalf. Look at verse 52. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith has made thee whole. And in Matthew's account, it says that Jesus touched his eyes. Luke says that when Jesus touched his eyes, he said, Receive your sight. So kind of putting these accounts together, Jesus touched his eyes. Jesus said, Receive your sight. Go your way. Your faith has made you whole. And instantly, instantly, this man was healed. Instantly, he could see. It says, and immediately, he received his sight. 2020 perfect vision. Who can do that? Only God can do that. Jesus was able to recreate the eye and make it well. But you know what else? And by the way, this one touch from Jesus, the touch of Jesus is the most loving, powerful touch ever. And he's willing to touch you today if you need it, wherever you need it. One touch can make everything all right. One touch, Jesus can meet whatever need that you might have. One touch from Jesus can replace the pain with happiness. And here was blind Bartimaeus. No longer was he blind Bartimaeus, but just blessed Bartimaeus. He had received the touch of the Lord. And by the way, not only did he receive his sight, look at the word whole, thy faith has made thee whole. The verb here is not the normal word for a healing. It's not imeo, which means to heal. It is sozo, which is the only New Testament word for salvation. Not only did he receive physical sight, but he was saved. His faith had made him saved. On a deeper level, his faith saved him spiritually. This was a great miracle where he's received not only a sight, but salvation. And by the way, if you've been born blind and you've been blind all your life and you finally get your sight, what's the first thing that you would be tempted to do? Run around and look at everything. Just see everything, especially there in that beautiful spot. But what does this man do? And it says, and he followed Jesus in the way. He spent his life following Jesus. He followed him all the way into Jerusalem, perhaps saw Jesus die for the sins of mankind. He had his eyes opened to see the greatest act of redemption in history, the death of Christ on the cross for sins. And then he lived the rest of his life following Jesus Christ. That's faith. Faith seizes God-given opportunities. It persistently cries out to God. It's rooted in the person of Jesus Christ. It comes to God based on mercy, not merit. It's personal, not general. Faith is specific in its focus. It is bold in its request, and it results in the mercy of God on our behalf. What a great story. What great lessons of faith for us. David Brainerd was an 18th century missionary to the American Indians. And once he was witnessing to this chief, this Indian chief that was getting close to being saved, but he held back. And Brainerd took a stick and he, he drew the stick in the, in, the, in the dirt around, or drew, drew a circle, I should say, around the chief in the dirt with that stick. And then he said to the Indian chief, he said, decide before you cross that line. Why was David Brainerd so urgent? Because he recognized that at that moment, Jesus was passing by with reference to that chief salvation. He had brought him to the place of conviction. That was the moment that he needed to decide. And I pray, friend, that you will see Jesus passing by here today. And that like this poor beggar, you'll cry out and say, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. Whatever the need is, cry out and say, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me on me. And I want to tell you something, friend. If you do, he will have mercy. Let's bow for prayer together. And so, Lord, we again thank you for this beautiful story and the lessons that we learned from Bartimaeus. May we have this quality of faith in us to see you for who you are that would cause us to cry out to you the Son of David, the Messiah, the Christ, 
Not because we're anyone, but because we know that you're rich in mercy and we come to you for mercy. Hear us, Lord. Work on our behalf. And with heads bowed and eyes closed, I'm going to ask you right there where you are to cry out to the son of David, the Messiah, whatever your need is, ask him right where you are for his mercy, whatever that need might be. Don't, don't wait, friend. He's passing by today. He's passing by right now. And he reaches out to you with loving arms of mercy. And he says, what would you that I would do for you? What do you, what do you want me to do for you? Friend, tell him your need. Tell him what you need. And if you're here today and you've never trusted Christ, the first thing you need to cry out for is his mercy and salvation. Would you say these words, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Save me. For Christ's sake, save me. Father, again, thank you for this beautiful story. Help us to learn from it, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.